Hey, how's everyone doing? Uh, my name is Ed Millar. I'm also a uh, master student in the Department of Folklore. And today I'll be talking about Rugelov on the Rock. Uh, Rugelov on the Rock was a food workshop organized by a graduate folklore course, Public Folklore, on November 24th at St. Thomas Church Hall. Uh, at the workshop, participants learned to roll, cut, and bake their own Rugelov, which is a Jewish crescent-shaped pastry. Um, you can see a bit of it there. Uh, the event was also funded by the Heritage Foundation and organized in uh, part of them, and it was led by Jonathan Richler, a St. John's native and president of the Jewish community have we got here. And there's your man there. Um, the workshop was uh, sold out as well, which I think was pretty amazing for a lot of us, it being our first time organizing an event. Um, and it was also very well received. Um, so, why food? You know, why a food workshop? Food is one of the most integral and meaningful goods produced by humans. At its most basic, food is an item of sustenance necessary for human survival. But the way that we prepare food, the way we cook food, and the way we talk about food as well, we really lay a lot of meaning into food. Uh, for instance, in the stories we tell. Um, food is one of the best mediums for getting your feet wet in a new community or culture. If anyone has met anyone from you know, somewhere other than your own, food is always a very big talking point, always a place for getting your foot in the door. As it turned out for the event was from a diverse background, we were successful in exposing a lot of people to one of the local traditions here in town, uh, which perhaps is not as visible and something that we don't necessarily think about in Newfoundland as well as thinking about um, there being a Jewish community here. And the workshop format gave everyone the opportunity to make and prepare their own Google under the, under the instruction of someone from that community, someone to whom Google App has special meaning. And you can see a picture there of um, some of the different participants learning to uh, first roll Google App, and then to so apply the uh, filling, which Jonathan made, which had a bit of blueberry, um, I think almonds and uh, chocolate as well, and then also uh, learning how to cut them and then roll them again. <coughs> After the making and the baking, we finished with a a Q&A session with Jonathan that a lot of us thought was perhaps one of the strongest aspects of the workshop is, you know, the opportunity for the participants to, you know, interact and ask questions um, to someone in the Jewish community here, um, which also touched on some more general subjects like growing up Jewish in St. John's. Um, he also spent some time in Montreal as well, so he provided some comparisons about living in Montreal, uh, you know, being Jewish and living in Montreal compared to being Jewish and living in St. John's. <coughs> so how did this all work? As a university course, similar to uh, the field school that Kayla had been presenting, we spent roughly half the time doing coursework on public folklore and the other half practicing and applying what we learned. Our coursework framed the event by making us ask particular questions. What does our involvement in this tradition mean? What is the purpose of the event? Why are we doing this? Uh, who is the target demographic? Is there a target demographic? And finally, and most I guess, importantly, what message are we sending hosting a Jewish pastry workshop at a church hall? Um, I'm not sure if you noticed in uh, one of the first photos there, there's a lot of, uh, sort of Christian imagery in the background of where Jonathan was presenting as well, where it says, you can't see the second half there, but it says, we follow Jesus, basically, behind all the language about this traditional <laughs> Jewish food. Um, and the way that we reasoned it is that we really intended the event to be open to the general public and church halls are first and foremost community spaces. So we really skewed the event as being, as taking place in a community space for a community, not just the Jewish community, but the St. John's community uh, in general. So tasks were divided between the seven students in the course, um, only one of whom had significant event planning experience before. Um, she's right there, it's Aaron Whitney as well. Um, uh, Jillian Gould, our professor in the course, uh, who's there in the back, she served as a guide for the project and really secured Jonathan as our workshop leader and articulated the theme of the event. Originally, we were hoping to work on, with Ms. Fasan, who is a, I think she was going to be helping us make gnocchi as well, which is an Italian, uh, sort of like a potato pasta, basically, but she um, became ill, so we had so we're scrambling around and about a month before the event was scheduled to do, we were able to secure Jonathan. Um, but anyway, 
Uh, the rest of it was up to us, so organizing you know, the event, securing this uh, space, which we ended up at Church Hall, um, and then gathering all the materials and all that stuff. So the hands-on approach gave us the opportunity to not only have our successes, but to also make our own mistakes or oversights and then learn from them. Sometimes the only way to really learn something is to just get in there and do it, and I think that really holds true for public sector work. Um, and after the event, we got together in class uh, for reflection on what went right and what went wrong. And there's a very <laughs> nice picture of it like, taken by um, Toshio uh, there as well. Um, so first we'll start with what went right. Uh, one of the biggest strengths we had uh, organizing the event was the teamwork. Everyone worked extremely well together. Uh, we all bounced a lot of ideas off each other. We all communicate very well, especially during the planning process. Um, while the event could have been planned by probably one or two people, um, we made sure to bypass evenly so no one was really sort of thinking about what to do during the uh, planning stages of the event. Uh, the leader of the workshop, Jonathan Urshley, was also extremely charismatic and insightful. His strength as, as a presenter was instrumental to the success of the event. Um, we, although it's not recommended, but we were unable to secure a meeting with him beforehand because it was very tough to get a hold of for like a face-to-face -face meeting. Um, but thankfully, that gamble paid off. And you know he, he had quite a bit of humor as well, which really created a nice atmosphere for everyone. And again, the, the participants in the workshop were really diverse in terms of age, gender, and background. And now for the bad, or what could have been different. It's not necessarily bad, it's not uh, that sample. It's, um, again, going back to this idea of there being uh, seven of us doing essentially three or four tasks um, during the event. We had a bit of a case of too many cooks in the kitchen. Uh, there were like a number of us that was a lot of downtime and we didn't really have any specific tasks to do. Um, the event was being recorded by audio, so we had someone doing that, we had someone taking photos. Um, we had someone as a facilitator for the event, which left four people sort of, you know, doing the general stuff, running back and forth from the kitchen, checking to see if anyone needs tea, and that sort of thing. And uh, one of the logistical concerns is that there's an uneven distribution of the Google app. Our planning didn't account for the oven space. They had this big, massive, you know, behemoth of an oven, but it actually only had enough space for four racks, and we had uh, roughly 17 or 18 people there, um, which meant that people were, and we could fit about two on each. So it meant that half the people got their food before everyone else, and that is never a good, <laughs> a good thing. Uh, so the other half of the people had to wait 30 minutes for theirs to finish, and then the people who already had theirs had to wait for the other people to get theirs. Um, so we were thinking um, in class that maybe next time when, when we're thinking about doing a food workshop, it's really important that people have access to the same product at the same time. And when we have people participating and making their own things, this can be achieved by pulling half of everyone's creations into one to share, and then giving them the other half of what they made um, to take home with them. And finally, one of, one of the oversights which I, I claim responsibility for because I learned to do it over the summer was uh, lack of evaluation forms. And so the evaluation forms are really important when you're organizing a workshop because they give you a sense of what's working and what's not working, right? Um, and because we can sort of think about, oh, you know, we should have met with them before and all this stuff, but really going to the participants and seeing what they liked and what they didn't like. Um, long story short, we didn't have them next time. We have to have that. <laughs> and finally, the conclusions, the tasty bits. Um, we learned that the big, the big thing behind the course was that we learned some of the basic skills necessary for a, a successful public folklore, so intangible cultural heritage officer, which is a bit longer, <laughs> but I think I'm with Dale. Um, it, being flexible, being a good multitasker, having a keen eye for detail, being a good people manager, as well as being a good time manager, and being versed in also some of the basic issues in the academic field. But most importantly, your heart really has to be behind it. If you don't have passion for this line of work, then it really shows in the final product and in the workshop. Um, and I think that these university community, you know, university community events where months or works with the community, uh, other partnerships or you know, presenting something for the community, they're really a great opportunity for the preservation and celebration of the province's wealth and intangible cultural heritage. Uh, and one thing to think going forward is, does the university have a duty or obligation to foster and maintain this relationship to the community? And which community are we really appealing to? 
I think when we have um, at least this sort of workshop like this, we're really focused on the St. John's community itself and on town without maybe factoring in Alcorn, Newfoundland and all of that. So and those are some things I think uh, going forward as well.